I do lefties throw slower than righties. Historically, this has been a thing. It's been easier to recruit lefties um, who throw maybe one, two, three miles an hour slower than righties. It's been easier to get to the big leagues as a lefty with lower velocity, um, less stuff, especially just based off of like new models and stuff plus model. Um, so looking at lefties, there is just overall in human nature, there's a genetic bias and a brain asymmetry bias that doesn't favor left-handed pitching and rotating left-handed anyway. Um, even looking at golf, there's not a million different left-handed golfers who are always winning tours. It's just not a thing. Lefty rotational um, capacity for lefties is a little bit not good, to put it bluntly. Um, rotation for lefties is just not good. There's different ways to compensate through it. And I'm going to try to talk about those ways. So quick shout out to the tread data team, Rylan and Kieran for running average velocity based off handedness over the last six years here. So every single year, righties are at least throwing a mile an hour harder. 1.2, I think is the lowest getting all the way up to, I believe like 1.6 or 1.7. Um, of the biggest separation there. So righties are throwing harder than lefties. And this has been a thing for as long as really we can run data for. And I know the hardest pitch of all time is thrown by Roldis Chapman at, I believe, 105.9. Um, a couple things about Roldis Chapman. Roldis Chapman's an anomaly. He's super fast, allegedly has beat Billy Hamilton in a 60 or 100 yard dash whatever it was, um, more research, you can probably look it up. Um, it's extremely strong. There's been rumors just like him in the Cincinnati Reds weight room when he was completely like going from the skinny little prospect that he was into putting on mass, just how strong that he had gotten. It's extremely mobile. There's videos out there of him doing extreme stretching um, and just being able to put his bodies and contort his body into like wild positions. He also throws from a higher slot. His 105.9, I believe, was from six foot four, six foot five, like 75, 76 inches. And he's also a counter rotation king. So, Rolls Chapman basically just put it into a giant summary of one word. He's an elite compensator. Two words, he's an elite compensator. He has found a way for him to contort his body and to put it in positions based off of what he has to be able to throw really hard. And even now, getting back up to 103 after. Uh, being in the league for as long as he has and sustaining the velocity that he has is really pretty impressive. So looking at why the brain is asymmetrical, um, the left side of the brain controls the right side of the brain or the right side of the body, the right side of the brain controls, controls the left side of the body. And within this, we are, I guess the biggest thing to know is that the left hemisphere of the brain has more motor, motor neurons. So the left side of the brain is just basically larger, has more control, um, and it really has a large role in timing and sequencing, which is very big for throwing. The biggest things, I mean, basically besides positions is being able to time up the, those positions and being able to sequence those positions so that we can have that kinetic sequence being able to be maximized to be able to produce the max force into the hand as possible. So that is a huge thing to understand with the brain. Um, one quick little snippet here too, just kind of like a conversation I was having with Kieran about why lefty hitters, maybe even with round two, um, why lefty hitters can or historically have hit pretty well. And you have like Ken Griffey, Tony Gwynn, um, they have a really good recognition of faces, places, and objects. That's just a quick thing. I know really nothing about hitting, but basically the right side of the brain controlling the left side of the body, they can't understand recognition of objects. And obviously baseball being an object, being thrown at them, and their spatial ability, they can probably just hit that ball better. Being a righty, a little bit more favored for throwing though, because like I said, the brain more in control of timing and sequencing there. So... There's a genetic asymmetry as well. So within our body, we also have a liver on the right side, colon, a gallbladder, a light, a right larger lung. Um, yeah, so we have everything on the right side is bigger. There's more weight. The gallbladder, as you can see, is coming down into like where the end of the rib cage would be. 
and that weight is pushed over onto that right side. So within left AIC, which is left anterior interior chain, uh, people stand on their right hip with their left leg kind of kickstand out and then rotated to the opposite side because there's just so much weight on the right side that we want to load into that hip and then shift our weight to the opposite side to balance. So because there's just a ton of weight and a ton of organs and a ton of like guts in the way on the right side, it makes it harder for lefties to get into that side, but it makes it really easy for righties to get out of that side. It's just like the weight being able to be stacked there. It makes it easier for us to push out of since we are already loaded into that side, but it makes it really hard to get into that side since there's already so much weight there. You have to basically get the guts out of the way or find a different compensation with leaning back or creating different um, different spaces or different shapes to be able to do that. So speaking of left AIC, this is basically a picture of left AIC. Um, you can see some people standing like this if you and Connor Harris will talk about this. If you're standing in a group of people having a conversation, a lot of people end up kind of leaning into the right hip. So the right hip is going to hike up a little bit. Right shoulder is going to drop. So we're closing down the space on the right side. Like I said, just because there's so much weight there. The left leg is going to be a little bit more forward and out. And then we're going to be rotated into that side as we're dropped. So the spine is rotated to the right. And the pelvis is rotated also into, um, into the right. So with that, the spine is rotated to the left. Sorry, don't let me misspeak. Spine is rotated to the left, pelvis is rotated to the right. If we twist, um, everything is creating a stacking there. And just a one way of balancing gravity, but everybody has this natural left AIC. It's just some people get pushed further. Some people maintain a little bit more balance just with different athletic moves. Like if you have a left-handed hitter, pitcher, golfer who makes millions and millions of swings upon reps on reps and through across many years, they're going to be able to not be stuck into this pattern. They're going to shift into a little bit more of like what a right AIC is, but going down to the, the stem of the root cause of everything is their gen gen genetics aren't going to change. They most likely aren't born with their guts shifted on the other side. So they still have this genetic limitation going on, but they found a different compensation. Humans are elite. They're going to find they they're going to find elite compensations or just compensations in general to accomplish a task that they are put onto or they're putting onto their body. Basically, going into the said principle, specific adaptations to impose demands. Whatever we do to our body, our body is going to find a way to try to accomplish that in the easiest way possible. So, within lefties, this isn't something where it's like you are stuck in this pattern. You're screwed. You're never going to be able to get out of it throwing left-handed and making all the reps that you're going to do across your career. It's going to switch things up a little bit, but there are compensations that must be created or there are ways that people have done it in the past that have shown to be pretty efficient and have like produced efficiency, longevity, and a ton of performance gains just with these like intricate, um, intricate ideas that they've accomplished. And who knows if it was on purpose, if they figured it out um, on accident, if their body just like was put into a place that lefties should be into, but I have a couple of theories on it that I'll get into here in a second. So the pelvis, and I'll show it even here too. So we have a right side pelvis bias towards IR, a left side pelvis towards ER. Connie Harris talks about this and shows it in the right. The sacrum is turned also to the right as the spine is rotated to the left. So just ignore the upper half, upper half rotated to the left which if we rotate to the right, is going to happen with our upper body anyway. But lower half, we pull this right side back and posteriorly tilt it slightly. What happens here is a little shift and a little windshield wiper action. That is all left AIC is, is that we're in our right hip. Think about like just kind of sitting into that when you're driving, when you're standing. What happens when you sit into it, kind of hikes a little bit, you pull it back, that left side opens up. Like I said, it goes forward, it abducts. It's going into extra rotation. As we sit into that right side, though, we're getting into a little bit of adduction and interrotation. So we're abducting and flexing and external rotating left side. We're adducting, internally rotating, and slight degree of flexion on the right side. This is what a standing posture is or how the body is naturally set as well. Um, it's just kind of like the way the pelvis is oriented. So 
with that, like the right side has what the left side needs and the left side has what the right side needs. And I believe we'll go into that. Yep, we'll go into that right here. So within that, we need to create more interrotation, adduction, and yeah, interrotation, adduction on the left side. Then we need to create a little bit more extra rotation and like hip extension on that or hip flexion on that right side. So we need greater degrees of hip flexion and we need um, more degrees of hip extension, hip interrotation on that left side. So basically what we're looking at too with throwers is a left side that is probably biasing a little bit more of an extra rotation bias. But like I've mentioned in previous videos, you have to find a way to create internal rotation to be able to produce force, transfer energy, create some extension power as well, and put force in the ground to then transfer that to the front side of the body. So within that, we'll talk about a couple of throwers like Diekman, like DL Hall, and like Braylon Marquez. So Jake Diekman, Turner created a bunch of stuff on him recently as well. Um, I think Diekman's an elite thrower, I've thought this for a little while. And I think the reasons why I always thought that is just kind of the way he threw crossbody. Like in my mind, there was a reason why he did it, and I didn't necessarily know why. But I think in my mind right now, I kind of have an idea. So page here. So Diekman, as he goes in the leg lift, gets up to 90 degrees. And then as he comes out of leg lift, he's getting into about 90 degree hip flexion as well. It's roughly there. It's probably a little bit less. Um, but he's pretty close. And like I mentioned in other videos too, 90 degrees of hip flexion is biasing the most internal rotation. So he is putting his pelvis into a bias of internal rotation, regardless of whether he has it or not, he's biasing it. So I think one thing that's pretty probably true about Diekman, and I wish I knew for sure, but it seems like he has a little bit more flat feet or can at least collapse his arch. So watching him throw creates a ton of dorsiflexion, creates a ton of like flattening of the arch to be able to, to create dorsiflexion, you have to flatten the arch anyway, and also just creating tibial internal rotation. So being able to create dorsiflexion is just pairing, flattening the foot, getting the arch into the ground, and then also pairing that with tibial internal rotation. And then as he's doing that and goes into foot plant, he started by biasing external rotation or creating an external rotation strategy of the back leg, then transferred that into that internal rotation strategy by using the ankle, the tibia, and getting that knee complex to twist as much as possible. So he's using the joint below his hip because lefties just don't have as much internal rotation in that hip. So he's using the joint below rather than the joint above, which if we use the low back, yeah, it can probably work. And Diekman does it a little bit but he's using the strategy of using the ankle and the tibia because most likely, like I said, I think he has flat feet. And I've seen it with one of my athletes in house, Mason Jones, who has extreme flat feet. We took his orthotics out, had orthotics for maybe like a year, year and a half, took him out and his throw completely changed because he could actually roll his foot into the inside arch, get his dorsiflexion and tibial internal rotation, like coupling and being able to actually use the ground with his back foot. So it was really interesting to see that he immediately started throwing like Diekman. So just going back to Diekman made the assumption like, okay, this guy's probably flat footed. His number one strategy to produce force is probably going to be using that ankle and knee. Like let's let Mason also do that as well. Moving on past just like what he's doing with that lower half. I think he really uses a ton of right leg internal rotation. So looking at his direction, cuts himself off a little bit, but because that right leg has a ton of internal rotation, Let's use it. Let's use that to block. And Braylon Marquez is going to do a similar idea too. We're going to use that right leg. DL Hall also going to use that right leg. So lefties actually have, don't know based off of biomechanical data, but lefties have a little bit more of a efficient lead leg block if they can get their pelvis into the position to use it. And like I said, if they use a joint below, like they stand a good chance there. So they have a pretty efficiently like block are able to get that hip to flex into a rotate adduct and stop all that energy to be able to send the upper half. And I think he does a really good job of that. And then the way he can cheat a little bit for the upper half, not being able to create that like deep horizontal abduction, like layback move. So I think he uses his low back late, creates an anterior pelvic tilt strategy to buy some hip extension that he's probably missing 
um, and also is able to come from like deep levels of thoracic flexion into a little bit of whatever he might have for a, or I guess just trunk flexion, don't even be specific about thoracic flexion. It's coming from a deep level of trunk flexion to be able to come back into some trunk extension, whether it's coming from the pelvis, the low back, the mid back, wherever it may be, he's able to create a position for his arm to just set a little bit deeper. So he has um, a range of motion to pull through and be able to accelerate the arm. So that's Diekman. D.L. Hall does a similar thing. I really like Diekman because I think I know his throw a little bit better, but D.L. does a similar move, but I think his lower half just isn't as mobile and as elite as Diekman's is. D.L. kind of finds a different strategy um, and also throws from a little bit of a higher slot. But Dale goes into a little bit of a higher leg lift as he comes down, has a similar load where he's slightly bending at the hip, roughly around 90 degrees, gets into the knee a little bit, uses that foot to collapse, not as much as Diekman, like I mentioned, but so we get it collapsed a little bit, knee comes a little forward, so he's pairing ankle pronation with tibial internotation, using the ankle and the knee to create some internotation strategy of that back leg, and then like I said about what lefties can do really well is just be able to use that lead leg, use that internal rotation that they have on that side and that ability to like open up space for the guts to just stop the lower half. Um, uses that really well. And then just throws from a little bit of a higher slot. Like I think he, especially coming out of high school, just had electric range of motion, being a little bit younger, body hadn't gone through too much stress yet. Um, had the elite range of motion, was able to compensate really well. Obviously, now he showed a little bit slower, but the range of motion, a little bit less, throwing differently. Um, that's neither here nor there, though. When DL is at his best, he does what Dickman does, just in a different kind of fashion. And DL is a little bit shorter, too, so it's a little bit harder for him. And then Braylon Marquez. Braylon was a prospect, if not still a prospect, the Cubs. Um, haven't seen too much of him throwing at all in the last three years, so very curious what's going on there. But Braylon uses a different strategy of throwing. Still kind of similar, finds a different way to compensate, but he kind of twerks up that lead leg and uses that like motion of like, creating a, a little bit of an internal rotation strategy coming from a high leg lift, internally rotating it, and then being able to like use that to kind of like torque the pelvis down. Um, off of that, I think the back leg just like really adducts, like his back foot kind of rolls to the inside, tibia kind of rolls to the inside, his left femur opens um, into adduction as well. But ultimately, I think that's because of the shape he creates by leaning back, going into leg lift and auto leg lift, and having that just excessive like tilt over into his backside. He's opening up so much space and that leads out of his body to then come into. So Basically, you think about it as like a water bottle. You flip a water bottle upside down. The space on the top is open. Space on the bottom has water filled. When you flip it, now you have space to go back down into the opposite side. So he's using the shapes and fluid to be able to get himself to do the opposite thing. So if he leans this way, he's going to have more range of motion to lean that way. Even if he's just going back to the center, he came from back here. And that's just like 30, 45 degrees of motion that he used to come back into the other side. So it's just creating a shape. Um, I know Bill Hartman and Dr. Mike K talk about this a lot, just creating different shapes and like throwing and in golf. Um, and that's something that is pretty shown here with Braylon. Like I didn't want to use D.O. and use Diekman because they have similar-ish moves. Like I wanted to use Braylon a little bit just because his move is different, just to show that lefties have different moves and compensations. It doesn't always have to be the same ankle tibia type move. They don't have to completely have that. If they do, great. That's pretty easy. You just look at those guys and it's like, okay, like, let's try to build some strategies like that. Looking at Braylon, you can use a different strategy of using lateral trunk tilt to be able to open up side space on the other side. And then, like I said, like lefties have a more innate ability to use that right leg to block from lesser um, abduction, lesser experimentation. They can use that to so let's stride a little bit cross body, plant from a deep level of hip internal rotation, adduction to be able to pull the pelvis back there. I think Breland does a really good job of that. One last note that I did not mention 
that I just remembered is the upper body too. So hopefully everybody stuck around for this because this is a big one. Lefties have lesser extra rotation and they have lesser horizontal abduction of their throwing arm. So specifically looking at this top right image, the left scap, and even in bench pressing, the left scap is pinned down and back as the torso is rotated this side. So our right scap is more upwardly rotated, protracted, and away from the center of the spine. So we have a very easy ability to get our arm to work back because like I mentioned about shapes, we're coming from a very far forward position. So we have a ton of room to come backwards and pull back from there. Lefties don't have any way to move backwards anymore um, unless they've created that compensation. Obviously this isn't everybody, but just a genetic way. Their scap is already pinned in downward rotations, pinned or retraction. So it's really hard for them to create a different position there. They have to create a compensation to be able to get there. Um, and that's why you see some lefties with push your arm actions or very early torsos because they're trying to find a strategy to be able to get their arm to flip up from a deeper spot or just from any kind of horizontal abduction. But if we take our arm and put it into zero horizontal abduction and just rotate, now we have a little bit of space, but we have an early torso, which you'll see a lot with lefties. And then the extra rotation piece as well is you're not going to be able to create any uh, any ER on that backside with the posterior left rib cage completely compressed. So right side, like I mentioned, there's so much, so much space there. We can completely drop back. Left side, can't really drop back. I'm completely shifted into left, left AIC. My body is completely asymmetrical. Like I'm one of the worst mean 100 towns that are one of the worst. So I have no left ER, have a ton of left IR, no right IR, ton of right ER. So one th way to look at the body is it's kind of like cross-sectional. So look at the right leg. It has the right side of the lower body has internal rotation. The left side of the upper body has internal rotation. So it's a little bit of a cross piece. The left lower body has external rotation. The right upper body has external rotation. So a little cross connect there. Just the way the body works isn't very like, it's not bilateral, it's very unilateral. It's very asymmetrical. And I figured the, the lefty external rotation, the lefty um, horizontal abduction piece would be huge for people to know. Just like you have to find a different strategy. That's why a lot of lefties have funky slots throw in different planes, or if they find different compensations, like I mentioned. But hopefully this video was exciting for everybody to listen to as it was for me to create. I love talking about this stuff. Um, lefties out there, if you have any questions, reach out to me about training ideas, training situations. I have a lot of left AIC information that I use with my guys. Um, I'm starting to use even more just to try to create some balance here and get lefties what they need and also give righties what they need. A little bit of a righties rolled out here, but lefties also, there. there's ways to train to be able to accomplish more of a symmetrical body. So you can have positions without compensating too aggressively with the wrong joints um, and putting yourself in bad situations. You can have those positions uh, retrained and get them 5% better. That opens up a ton of space for you to be able to move through and feel good. So let me know if you guys need anything, but thank you for coming out.